Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India lecture lecture number 2 in folklore studies we try to understand as to what kind of approaches to folklore are available in the corpus of discussions on folklore in folklore studies and also intersecting with studies in various other branches of modern social sciences in previous lecture, we tried understanding some of the fundamentals associated with the term folklore. We understood the problems associated with the origin of folklore studies, the way it started. We got a sense of the nationalist, romantic and evolutionary scheme, which were instrumental in the beginning of folklore studies and as far as the definitional feature of folklore is concerned we understood that the dissociation between folk and their lore is not very helpful in this lecture we engage with a little more we engage with the intricacies of the term folklore folk and their lore and thereby we begin to realize the various kind of approaches that are prevalent in folklore studies. It was mentioned in the previous lecture as to how Alan Duns very insightfully tries to persuade us to look beyond the set ways of understanding folklore. He tried to simplify the issue and proposed his idea of folk. He suggested that the folk can refer to any group of people whatsoever who share at least one common factor. As far as the idea of lore is concerned, he provides a list that he himself acknowledged to be not comprehensive enough. And his list of folklore included myths, legends, folk tales, jokes, proverbs, riddles, chants, twisters, tongue twisters, greetings and leave taking formulas that is see you later, alligator, in a while, crocodile, etc, etc. It also includes folk costume, folk dance, folk drama and mime, folk art, folk belief or superstitions, folk medicine, folk instrumental music that is fiddle tunes, folk songs that is lullabies, ballads, etc., folk speech that is slang, folk similes that is as blind as bat, folk metaphors for example to paint the town red and names that is nicknames in Bangla we call dark nam and place names. Folk poetry ranges from oral epics to autograph book verse, epitaphs, latrinalia which means writings on the walls of public bathrooms, limericks, ball bouncing rhymes, jump rope rhymes, finger and toe rhymes, dandling rhymes which would include some something like this to bounce children on the, on the knee, counting out rhymes to determine who will be it in games and nursery rhymes. The list of folklore forms also contains games, gestures, symbols, prayers, practical jokes, folk etymologies, food recipes, quilt and embroidery designs, house, barn and fence types, street vendor cr vendors cries and even the traditional conventional sounds 
used to summon animals or to give them commands. I mean, there are particular ways of you know summoning animals. For goat in Hindi heartland in India, we hear something like ar. Likewise, for various other kind of animals, cattle, livestock, we have particular sounds to command them. There are such minor forms as mnemonic devices, mnemonic devices which means which triggers your memory, which excites your memory, which stimulates your memory, those mnemonic devices such as the name Roy G. Beav to remember the colors of the spectrum in order, envelope sealers could be mnemonic devices which something like sealed with kiss could be an envelope sealer serving as mnemonic device and the traditional comments made after body emissions such as burp or sneezes or fart. There are such major forms as festivals and special day or holidays, customs that is Christmas, Halloween and birthday and likewise in the context of South Asia we can enlarge the list furthermore. A scholar like Eliot Oring responds to the this long list by pointing out that the list fails to come up with common denominator for the numerous items in order to formulate an adequate definition. He provides a range of definitions that sum up the variety of attributes that have been associated with the idea of folklore. And this summing up by Oring also begins to show as to how we should be playing with folklore in our intellectual exercise of comprehending them. Oring says, materials that circulate traditionally among members of any group in different versions whether in oral form or by means of customary example, they could be all dubbed as folklore. The hidden submerged culture lying behind the shadow of official civilization, they could be all brought together to be considered as folklore. Artistic communication in small groups, communicative processes and forms which evidence continuities and consistencies in, in human thought and behavior through time and space, they can be all brought under the larger canvas of folklore. The purpose is not to necessarily offer a conclusive definition, the purpose is to highlight the significance of openness with the term folklore. The idea is not to accept them uncritically. Oring himself has suggested an orientation rather than a definition necessary for understanding folklore. According to him, an orientation based on concepts that inform the perspectives of folklorists in their research is productive rather than restrictive. And, and therefore, it is necessary for the students of folklore studies to be reminded of the necessity to be oriented in understanding folklore rather than following a formulaic definition of folklore. Because given the wide range that is included within folklore, it would be very difficult to operate with any kind of definitional formula. To return to a question that was raised in the previous lecture, one has to ask as to what was the idea of folk to begin with. Likewise, like we had encountered misconceptions about the term folklore itself, misconception stemmed from the assumption that human society develops in a linear progression from one stage to another stage of civilization. This assumption that human society developed in a linear progression from a simple uneducated primitive state to a complex educated sophisticated state led to the definition of the folk in opposition or in contrast with the upper stratum or elite of that society. The folk were contrasted on one hand with civilization, they were the uncivilized element of a civil, civilized society and on the other hand they were contrasted with the so called savage or primitive society which was considered even lower on the evolutionary ladder. The folk uh, 
possessed what Lang called a mean term, the intellectual link between civilized and primitive. One should recall Andrew Lang's essay, which was titled The Method of Folklore, and it appeared in his uh, uh, monograph, Custom and Myth, published in 1884. And this was representative of the 19th century view of folklore. Lang stated, folklore is only concerned with the legends, customs, beliefs of the folk, of the people, of the classes, which have least been altered by education, which have shared least in progress. Duns has also criticized this kind of understanding of folk and their lore. The folk were similarly associated with rural and equated with peasant in some of the South Asian uh, contexts. Rural was compared with urban and peasant was contrasted with city dwellers. Primitive people, since they supposedly lacked cities, could not be termed rural. Folk, as an old-fashioned segment living on the margins of civilization, was and for that matter still is equated with the concept of peasant. Alan Duns very wisely blames American anthropologists such as Redfield for the continued use of this narrow definition of folk as peasant. Robert Redfield was famous for giving the formulation of little tradition, great tradition, which was furthermore discussed by Milton Singer. These formulations suggested that there is a classical tradition of literate, elite, educated class. It was a textual tradition of literate, educated, elite class, which was available in print. And there was, on the, on the other hand, little tradition of unreflective few of the masses, not in print, available in their oral articulation. Duns criticized it, saying, Redfield proposed an ideal typology in which folk and urban were at opposite ends of a continuum. In this scheme, it would be absurd to speak of urban folklore. And therefore, Duns' criticism is fair enough. Dunn's criticism also offers us an opportunity to formulate an approach, a qualitatively different kind of approach to folklore, which will be more inclusive, irrespective of the divide of urban and rural, primitive and civilized, peasants and city dwellers. It seems all these efforts have played very important role in overcoming Robert Redfield's kind of dichotomy and they enable us to answer a fundamental question and the question being, who are the folk? Duns highlighted the important notion that the folk are not quaint, old-fashioned people living in exotic communities in far-off places. He says, the term folk can refer to any group of people whatsoever who share at least one common factor, it does not matter what the linking factor is. It could be a common occupation, language or religion, but what is most important is that a group formed for whatever reason will have some traditions which it calls its own. Thus, all of us are members of folk groups and thereby we see the importance of the word tradition in folklore studies. It suggests that the very act of having and performing folklore means a group is a folk group. With this flexible definition of folk, a group could be as large as a nation or as small as a family. We begin to see the wide spectrum of folklore in day-to-day -day life from family to nation state. A folk group could consist of a few or two individuals as long as it has a special set of traditions. There may be also part-time folk groups such as summer camp. And likewise, one can go ahead, 
go on suggesting that folklore, there could be folk group, there could be a very sustainable kind of very patterned interaction based folk group available on social networking websites as well. Websites such as Facebook could be a platform where folk tend to perform their folklore, their contemporary folklore. The focus on performance paved the way for further broadening of the idea of folk. The study of performance led to the consideration of the relationship between audience and performers and the formation of group identity. William Janssen emphasized the role of esoteric exoteric factors in the development of the idea of folk group. According to him, both insiders and outsiders define or delineate a group. Folk groups base a lot of their folklore on presenting themselves to others or on defining themselves in relation to other groups. This often happens in order to combat stereotypes or to extend a group's own stereotypes of others. In this process, folk groups define themselves more clearly. With this kind of broader understanding of who the folk could be and what the folklore could be and where all we can locate them, not only in some kind of primitive, esoteric, very museumized, fossilized kind of setup, also in urban locations. With this broad view, it becomes possible for us to understand as to what kind of approaches may unfold in folklore studies. It would be at the price of repetiting, but repetition which might be helpful in reminding us some of the fundamentals. It should be said that the discipline of folklorists began in the 19th century as we have noticed in the first lecture. Closely tied to currents of romanticism and nationalism, it was the serious study of folklore found an enthusiastic audience among individuals who left nostalgia for the past and the necessity of documenting the existence of national consciousness or identity. The romantics thought that those who lived farther away from civilized society, that is those in rural areas and small villages were closest, closer to humanity's natural and therefore better state. Scholars traveled to these more remote areas to collect the remaining fragments of the so-called pristine folk culture. We have also learned that German scholars in the 18th and 19th centuries believed that members of the rural lower class communities of Germany held the knowledge of the country's past. Scholars decided that they needed to collect and document this diminishing knowledge, disappearing knowledge. Germany's cultural history should not be lost, that was the idea. Two of the early scholars in this field, as we noted in the previous lecture, the Grimm brothers, they came up with Grimm's fairy tales and this collection which is still read by many of, many, many of the growing up children is a collection of stories shared by rural folk of Germany. These are some of the early texts which were collected. We have also learnt about Andrew, Andrew Lang's essay, The Method of Folklore and we have also learnt as to how these collections provide us with a premise to go about formulating some of the major approaches to folklore. Alan Dunn says something very interesting. He says and I quote, there is a science, archaeology which collects and compares the material relics of old races, axes and arrowheads. There is a form of study, folklore, which collects and compares the similar but immaterial relics of old races, the surviving superstitions and stories, the ideas which are in our time but not of it. There is also, we have also understood that there is a performance approach to folklore which helped 
to move the attention of the discipline to the study of folklore forms in specific contexts. The collection of context became the primary occupation for folklorists and many of the anthropologists too. The understanding of how people create, share and relate to folklore texts became central to the collection of folklore items. How, what kind of general classification emerged when we look at variety of resources, variety of folklore collections that we have briefly hinted just now. The task of classification of folklore items is closely related to the objective of a definition of folklore and we realized that giving a formulaic definition of folklore is nearly impossible due to the fact that folklore happens to have a very wide ambit. Duns was very suggestive when he passed this opinion that defining folklore would boil down to the task of defining exhaustively all forms of folklore. The answers to the questions like what a proverb is or what a superstition can contribute majorly to an enumerative definition of folklore. However, in the history of the discipline, not so much as one genre has been defined exactly. And therefore, while we are making an attempt to understand as to what kind of definition could be offered, we also get sensitized by Dunn's remarks. Folklorists attitude towards the problem of definition is exemplified in the remark of Stith Thompson as well. Thompson confesses that a lack of a basic definition is actually a great convenience because it avoids the necessity of making decisions and it avoids the necessity of getting into long debates as to the exact narrative genre to which a particular story may belong. And this was also resonant in Dan Ben Amos attempt which attributed the problem of genre classification to our zeal for scientific methodology. The urge to classify folklore has been necessarily related to the dominance of positivistic scientific methodology in which everything has to be very clearly defined and typified. Ben Amos goes on telling us that we have attempted to construct logical concepts which would have potential cross-cultural applications and to design tools which would serve as a basis for a scholarly discourse providing it with defined terms of reference and analysis. In the process, however, we transformed traditional genres from cultural categories of communication into scientific concepts. And this transformation into scientific concepts is a big loss for our intellectual endeavor to understand folk folklore. He therefore proposed the idea of ethnic genres in accordance with the cultural reality of folklore. Ethnic genres are cultural modes of communication. Analytical categories are models for the organization of texts in ethnic genres. And such an approach would be termed more holistic approach to folklore in the sense that it would not try to reduce the categories of communication into categories of scientific discourse. Furthermore, along this line it is important to understand that some of the approaches to folklore would also try to suggest certain kind of relation between the text of folklore and the context it, in which it has been performed. As we noted, performance, the dimension of performance allows us to get into the, into this relation of text and context. Once again, Duns would like to encourage the discussion and scholarship of genres and he would propose three levels of analysis, each of which can aid in the task of definition, but it would also go beyond the formulaic idea of definition. 
According to him, with respect to any given item of folklore, one may analyze its texture, its text and its context. It is unlikely that a genre of folklore could be defined on the basis of just one of these, not only one of these three. Instead, he would suggest that it may be analyzed at all these three levels at once, the level of texture, text and context. Ideally, a genre should be defined in terms of all these three according to Duns. Duns would furthermore spell out textural features of folklore forms in verbal forms of folklore, textural features are linguistic features. For example, the textural features of proverbs include rhyme and alliteration. Other common textural features include stress, pitch, juncture, tone and onomatopoeia. However, we are cautioned that any kind of def, definite definition of folklore may reduce one level of analysis as most conclusive level. Reduction of the analysis of folklore to the analysis of language alone will amount to linguistic fallacy according to Duns and hence he would strongly suggest not to reduce it to any one level. One understands that rhyme may well be a textural feature of some proverbs, rhyme, proverbs may have its own rhymic quality, but the fact that rhyme is also found in some riddles means that it is of limited value in distinguishing a proverb from a riddle and hence one has to be cautious while operating with Dunn's formulation. While folklorists and linguists have engaged with text and texture, respectively the third level of analysis focusing upon the context has been almost completely ignored. Context which is material context, context which is an historical encounter, context which receives all kind of influences coming from various passages in time and space, that becomes the black box which invites critical discussion. The context of an item of folklore is a specific social situation in which that particular item is actually employed. Duns once again would highlight the importance of context by saying, the importance of collecting context is especially obvious in the study of jokes. Variants of jokes recorded without context may be of value to historic geographers plotting paths of diffusion, determining degrees of cognition and plotting developmental sequences of subtypes, but context less jokes are of limited value to the social scientists. Two of the most vital constituents of the contextual structure are the person telling the joke and the audience listening to it. It is a common place that context can influence text and also structure in the sense that a taboo lexical item will be used in one situation but not in another. This is such a useful suggestion, why? Because a joke out of context might become source of all kind of offenses. It can leave many people sentimentally hurt if the context of joke is lost. Folklore research should not limit itself solely to the collection of context, context either. Context is important, but one should also be looking for something else. The information about contextual feature is a beginning, not an end. The contextual details alone cannot define a genre and it must be complemented by a meticulous collection of textual and textual data. The best definitions of the various forms of folklore will be based upon criteria from all three levels of analysis. Returning to the folklorist Mazharul Islam, who highlighted the problem of the study of the folklore without 
the context of the folk, folk or society. He emphasized that a teller or a singer and his listeners cannot be isolated from the tale or the song presented. Islam in fact very critically cites the classical anthropologist Malinovsky, whose name is most important when one has to discuss functionalism in classical anthropology. And Islam would write and I quote, the text of course is important, but without the context it remains lifeless. As we have seen, the interest of the story is vastly enhanced and it is given its proper character by the manner in which it is told. The whole nature of the performance, the voice and the mimicry, the stimulus and the response of the audience mean as much as to the natives, as much to the natives as the text. And the sociologists should take his cue from the natives and not just plant a sociological formulation upon natives. The performance again has to be placed in its proper time setting, the hour of the day and the season with the background of the sprouting gardens awaiting future work and slightly influenced by the magic of the fairy tales. We must also bear in mind the sociological context of private ownership, the sociable function and the cultural role of musing fiction. All these elements are equally relevant all must be studied as well as the text. The stories live in native life. The stories live, I repeat, in native life and not on paper. And when scholar jots them down without being able to evoke the atmosphere in, in which they flourish, he or she has just given a mutilated bit of reality. Pretty strong words by Mazarul Islam. And in order to capture, as Islam says, in order to capture the pulse of the people and understand the relation between folklore and culture, one has to go about recording of a series of facts along with the texts. And what is this series of facts? These are time and place of telling, singing, performing, sculpting, painting, playing, designing, framing, making, informant informant or teller, performer, group or an individual who are the audience or all particulars in good detail of these people belonging to two sides, the gesture and posture of the narrator. The whole nature of the performance, facial expression, mimicry, his dance, acting, imper impersonation, pantomime, the total reaction of the audience, occasional comments of the audience and laughter and his response in the form of dancing or singing or acting, uh, acting out parts in tale. Audience are no longer separated from the performance and therefore, it is the job of anybody doing a serious comprehension study of, uh, of folklore to take into account both the performer and the audience alongside the text of the performed. All these suggestions are very important to remember when one is trying to understand the important approaches to folklore. What is the significant part of various approaches to folklore is an understanding of the functions of folklore. As it was mentioned in the previous lecture, the functions of folklore instantly require one to have a sense of the society where this folklore is performed. And there are so many important discussions on the functions of folklore. William Bascom in the article called the four functions of folklore lays out the functions of folklore in a broad sense, which could be applicable to many forms of folklore. According to him, the four functions of folklore include entertainment, validation of culture's customs and rituals, the teaching of lessons and exercise of control. I repeat, the four functions of 
of the folklore include number one entertainment, number two validation of cultures, customs and rituals, number three the teaching of lessons and fourth exercise of control. There is, there is an idea of social order involved in it in this function of folklore, there is an idea of inculcation of values involved in it, there is an idea of the reaffirmation of culture's significance, rich, uh, significance of customs and rituals involved in it and of course, lastly but not the least important is the function of entertainment which means persuading the folk to take the folklore seriously. The context of folklore item also helps in the determination of its function and use. In order to explain as to why a particular text is used in a particular situation, the collection of context becomes imperative. So, attempt to understand folklore, folk and their lore and the deeper intricate relations take us to discursive tropes where we develop the idea of folklore and simultaneously we begin to see the kind of dominant approaches which have been used in discussing folklore. One of the most dominant approach amongst others has been sociological anthropological approach which includes the early stage of ethnological exercises, ethnological exercises in which folklore materials were collected even though it was not professedly in sociology and anthropology, the significance of those ethnological exercises in anthropology has been realized for a very long time. In addition to sociological and anthropological approach, we also have approaches such as conduit, multi-conduit approach. We have an approach arising from say for example, cultural and performance studies. We have approaches based on uh, uh, feminist theorization, uh, uh, we have approach based on uh, women's question, queer question. We also have approach based on the kind of theoretical discussion which happens within the larger framework of postmodernism. All these approaches give us various kind of ideas about folklore. To begin with, let us re uh, briefly reflect upon what kind of currents have been prevalent under anthropological and sociological approaches. We understand that folklore and anthropology have shared journey. They emerged together with European roots and shared the social, social evolutionary idea inherent in Darwinism. From the beginning of their chronicles, anthropologists explored individuals and societies other than their own all over the world and folklorists looked into the legend of their own kin as it existed in the past though through an assessment of culture. The orders of folklore and social anthropology have differed enormously though they have shared meanings of folklore. Many folklorists and anthropologists adopted the resembling intellectual temperament, styles and perspectives too. We remember the Russian structuralist folklorist Vladimir Propp, who unequivocally denied that material culture and customs were folklore and contended that these kind of conventions ought to be left to ethnologists. In America, there was a similar demand too. The idea was to have in folklore something that Propp, Vladimir Propp called profound folklore without a touch of material culture. This was a phase of book view in folklore studies so to say. In folklore research we find later on folklorists and anthropologists try to shift from this book view which was prevalent amongst early ethnologists. This shift from book view was to take folklore research to field against the non-field based research which was prevalent in classical folklore researches. There have been numerous anthropological ways to deal with folklore depending on culturally diverse and cross-cultural theories. For example, the German scholar Max Müller propounded solar mythology to show that folklore was devolutionary. He persuaded to rise above 
a theory that he had formulated. This was a theory of disease of language, which meant the decline of a culture. And he suggested that going beyond this idea of decline of culture, qua disease of language, one can experience how primitive man adored the sun. He emphasized that the folklore of present diminish fantasy and disables us to see the sun as the king of solar system. This is the disease of the language in contemporary times, times whereas the folklore of primitive allowed to trust the mythological narratives. Max Muller's theory came under critique when Andrew Lang mischievously employed Muller's techniques to demonstrate that both Max and Muller were impressions of solar mythology. Andrew Lang's very own survival's theory was that all peoples and societies evolved in a fixed systematic movement of stages and hence the romance of Max Muller was according to Lang misplaced. Though Lang's theory too had limitations and gradually lost acceptance. More discussion on theorization, more discussion on theorizing about folklore will happen in later lecture. We are just trying to understand it as to what kind of approaches we come across in a lot of these theory building exercises about folklore. Moreover, anthropological approach to folklore includes the myth ritual theory and abstract methodology embraced by uh, a classicist such as Sir James Fraser and others who looked to find the examples and types of custom of early man similar to Max Muller's sun oriented folklore. This too was devolutionary and to serve the intellectual hunger in the in the west uh, intellectual hunger in the west for the primordial past about which we learned in the first lecture. The pattern theory of culture again within anthropology and sociology which also includes ethnography, functionalism, structuralism are among other theoretical approaches that characterize the anthropological interest in folklore. Ruth Benedict's pattern theory of culture is most fundamental to approach folklore. Benedict affirmed that all pieces of culture are connected and reflect though in some cases in various ways they reflect similar qualities and convictions that there is a unified entirety of behaviors, qualities, values and beliefs. Benedict's theory infers that culture is one, each part revealing the entire and that the role that the oral and material folklore are windows into culture. This was quite a watershed intervention in the folklore inquiry. The anthropological interest in folklore in 20th century was determined by Benedict's perspective in great deal. It paved the way to comprehend the meaning of culture through the method of ethnography. Taking a jump cut, Clifford Geards alongside numerous other contemporary anthropologists in latter part of 20th century stressed on ethnography as a significant and effective method for investigating society in general and ethnography being also very useful in approaching folklore. Structuralism marks another anthropological approach to deal with folklore and within a structuralism we get to hear of again the work of Vladimir Propt's morphological investigation, the oral formulaic method and William Lebaugh's arrangement of story an examination that utilized basic investigation techniques applied to the investigation of account and other oral structures. Likewise, we hear of Claude Levistros's paradigmatic structuralism, the journey for fundamental profound structures, generally sets of binaries. And this was incredibly prominent for a while in, uh, in the 20th century. Levistros convinced that his arrangements of paired alternate extremes also called binaries were all inclusive and mirrored the essential idea of human mind. The idea that all types of folklore fulfill some significant mental social function is fundamental in most folklore inquiries during the 20th century. It was however heavily criticized on the ground that it lacked 
in taking note of the historical encounters between folklore and critical events in history that it lacked in understanding the material dimension of folklore. Furthermore, symbolic anthropological approach shows another way of dealing with folklore. Rick Turner's name comes very prominently who tried to suggest that anthropological approach to folklore would have in the larger framework of structural anthropology would have a lot of symbols for discussion. It also suggested the relationship of symbols with power and in addition to these kind of you know approaches that we come across in anthropology, we have the larger approach which was dominant for a very long time and which is known as functionalism. The functionalist approach in anthropology to societal question in general and folklore in particular itself has varied layers. A classical anthropologist such as Bronislaw Malinowski's position that everything in human life must have a function comes in connection with the works of Durkheim and Marcel Moss. It um, encompasses psychobiological human which was the case with Malinowski's approach, functionist approach and it also encompasses social structures of a group which was the case with Radcliffe Brown's functionist approach and thirdly functionalism, functionist approach would up incorporate the common mental structures of conscience collective which was very prominent in the discussions of Emile Durkheim and Marcel Moss. Malinowski's biopsychological work is important for folklorists who are keen on unraveling the mind behind the folklore. Malinowski gives need theory to, un to support his, uh, his, his psychological functionalist approach which is very useful in long run in understanding the deeper psychic significance of folklore. Radcliffe Brown on the other hand emphasized on social relations expressed in social structures and that too will be very useful approach in understanding folklore and Marcel Moss and Durkheim were adding a very larger perspective to the functionalist approach in which they tried understanding not only the idea of solidarity, they also tried understanding social order, they also emphasized on a primitive category such as totem around which an elementary forms of religious life is woven. In all these approaches, we begin to understand the larger panorama of sociological and anthropological discussions on not only social structure, also the materials the oral materials coming from that social structure about that social structure that is folklore. In addition to sociological and anthropological approach as I told you there are other kind of approaches such as conduit multi conduit theory. Linda Degg and Andrew Vazunoi formulated an idea to clarify why folklore genres preserve steady and solidified ordinary structures while in the process of transmission they spread. Conduit analysis discloses how private inclinations lead to innovation and specialization in the structure of territorial, ethnic and individual collection of enchanting stories, ghost apparition stories, saints folklore, murder melodies or fanciful stories and likewise other kind of you know genres within folklore. If multi conduit theory gives us an idea to understand as to how to visualize folklore as a dynamic entity, culture studies and performance studies take us many steps forward. Folkloristics converges with cultural studies when it pursues Americo Paradis challenges of the 1970s. It seeks to place question of politics of culture at the heart of the discipline of folklore and this is very crucial which will unfold in yet another lecture which will be centralized on folklore as cultural politics.
Charles L. Briggs and Amy Schumann noted in their 1993 New Perspectives issue of New Perspectives on Western folklore. As such, when folklorists address how folklore is formed by and therefore shapes socio-cultural power relations, they take part in the social investigation. Investigating the grid of society, vernacular, well-known and nearby exhibitions as a governmental issue of culture, folklorists have started to conjecture social creation from both worldwide and neighborhood positionings. Likewise, within cultural and performance studies, we also find some of the Marxist approaches very strongly available. Marxist folklorists such as Jack Zipes, for instance, has unveiled the operation of belief system in prevalent pre, uh, imitated uh, fantasies. John Dost has portrayed the traditionalizing practices of a world class US suburb that, in a postmodern turn, records and markets itself through pamphlets, brochures, glossy travel magazines, gallery displays, postcards, tourist snapshots, amateur art, styles of interior decoration and suburban architecture and landscape. Likewise, Susan Davis has examined the manner by which public parades, albeit as often as possible, used to state the prevailing society's ideological plans. But these public parades may likewise work for subjected groups as vehicles for protest as well as for historical commemoration. Jos Limon has historicized and confined the investigation of social logical inconsistencies of race, class and gender in Mexican American social wars. And Barbara Babcock has investigated how corchetti women have contrived to tell stories through their stoneware about men's narrating. In this manner, subverting masculine discursive control and aggravating the distribution of local power profoundly. Likewise, we also find Elezia Garcia has enunciated the manners by which indigenous narrating capacities as a type of social obstruction and safeguarding. Deborah Kapchan investigated the developing governmental issues of gendered exhibitions in the Moroccan commercial center and coming closer home, Arjun Appadurai and many of his colleagues concentrate on South Asian expressive customs to show full and direct encounter between the problematics of performance and textuality on the one hand and of social and cultural history on the other, which is very important because with this kind of discussion that Arjuna Padurai, A. K. Ramanujan and many of other folklorists would start with this kind of discussion, we begin to understand the, the strong relation folklore has with history, with historical encounters in the trajectory of time. We begin to understand that folklore is not merely a museum material, not merely a sanitized cultural material, we begin to see folklore as also a cultural site for contestation of power. In this approach, we also join another kind of perspective which informs this kind of approach and that gives an, us an idea that there is possibly an ethnic approach to folklore. European models of ethnological research has shaped the reason for the acculturation model of folklore research. This procedure of cultural adjustment requires the perception of transgenerational folkloric articulation. Linda Degg, a very noted scholar of folklore, has constantly proposed that the cognizance of the ethnic limits and the assessment of intercultural relations ought to be the attention of research on ethnic folklore. One should also be reminded of the Norwegian ethnographer Frederick Barth. Barth's proposition in 1969 about ethnic groups and boundaries is very crucial. He would tell us that the comprehension and meaning of ethnic groups cultural materials 
requires one to be sensitive to the boundaries an ethnic group would draw around it. In his own words, the ethnic boundary that defines the group, not the cultural stuff that it encloses, is supposed to be most central in understanding folklore. If we can connect Frederick Barth's this proposition with folklore studies, it would offer us a very novel approach. William Hugh Johnson came up with the esoteric exoteric factor in folklore in 1959. Johnson examined the scope of variables related with limit making and maintenance as they are uncovered in oral account. His work recommended that by analyzing the folklore of a group, of a group's very own mental self, we get pictures of different groups. Likewise, furthermore, there is a good amount of literature produced by scholars undertaking feminist approach, centralizing the category of gender, centralizing women's question and also the question of homosexuals, which gives us an idea of a potential queer approach to folklore. One can recall just for example, Baldwin and Yocom who contemplated how family stories and, st and narrating contrast among people in their Anglo-American and Pennsylvania German families. In the context of South Asia, one remembers Gloria Goodwin Raheja's work, Anne Gold's work, Prem Chaudhary's work, Kirin Narayan's work. Some of these works have been very crucial in understanding as to how women's question can figure in folklore researches. These approaches are equally important to be remembered. Furthermore, there is folk urban continuum approach, which is also found in sociological discussion in great deal. Robert Redfield's examination during the 1930s and it was a joint undertaking with Milton Singer during 1940s and 1950s helped us understand that folklore can be divided into little tradition and great tradition with certain kind of approaches which will bring them together. With some of these approaches, we begin to understand the possibilities of approaching folklore in various ways. Further discussion along this line would be in the next lecture. Thank you.